Hello there. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how you can make programmatically changeable morphs inside of the Unreal Engine. And you can do this using Daz Studio morphs that you already have. You can actually import Daz Studio morphs into the Unreal Engine and then modify how much they're applied to the character uh, based on a value that you assign to it programmatically. So uh, I believe this would be really useful for character creators. You can kind of create the character and change how it looks, and then you can maintain that look over the course of the game. This is actually known as using morph targets. So if you want to know more about them, you can always go ahead and do a search for more morph targets. And in fact, the uh, Unreal Engine website, or the Epic Games website, has a live training on morph targets where they kind of go over the basics of morph targets. So I'm going to go ahead and show you the workflow for getting the morph targets into the Unreal uh, Engine and then being able to use those morph targets to modify your characters. Then to do the animations we're going to go ahead and use iClone and I want to talk to you guys a little bit about how 3D Exchange works and some of the kind of ambiguity that comes from iClone 3D Exchange uh, but we'll get into that a little bit afterwards and we'll also talk about some of the issues that you're going to run into when uh, importing the morph targets and using other programs with them. So let's go ahead and get started. And the first thing you're going to want to do is actually open up Daz Studio. All right, so here I have Daz Studio open. And one of the things you're going to want open is your timeline. So you're going to want to go to Window, Panes, and Timeline if you don't have it opened already. And you're probably going to notice that my timeline looks a little different, a little funny compared to yours. And that's basically because I've gone down here to my frames and I've set it to a total of two. That's because for this, we're only going to need two frames, and it will save a little bit in the future when we are exporting some of our files. Uh, it'll actually save some, some time. All right, so to get started on your timeline, you're going to want to make sure that your cursor or your actual position is set to the first frame of the timeline. So let me explain this a little bit more. The first frame on your timeline uh, is going to be what your character looks like normally inside of the engine, so without any morphs that are going to be applied in the Unreal Engine. So what you're going to want to do is, while you're on the first frame, and I think you're on the first frame by default when you open up the Dash Studio, but just double check. Apply all of your morphs, all of your uh, outfits, anything you want your character to be have uh, in their normal state. These will not be, the morphs will not be imported into the Unreal Engine. Okay, it will only be, uh, and I'll show you in the next step, what, how we determine which morphs will actually be imported into the Unreal Engine. So once you have your character all set up in the first frame, and I do here, the very next step you're going to want to do is actually go to the second frame in your animation. Okay, now you shouldn't notice any change. When you go from your first frame to your second frame, the character should look exactly the same. However, what we're going to do is we're going to now apply on the second frame all of the morphs that we want to import into the Unreal Engine. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up a morph I have called Heavy, which causes the character to uh, look obese. So let me go ahead and pull that up now. And so here we go, I have my morph that causes the character to look obese. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this slider, and again, I'm on the second frame while I do this. I'm going to take my slider, and I'm going to move it all the way up to the maximum. Now I suggest you go to the maximum of the slider, because remember, you're going to be able to programmatically change this morph inside of the Unreal Engine. So you want to be able to go to the full extent of the slider, uh, inside of the Unreal Engine. So I, I recommend always going to the maximum. Even if you don't plan on using the maximum amount, I still recommend going to the maximum on the slider for any of the morphs that you want to apply in the Unreal Engine. Okay? So you can do actually more than just one morph, and they'll come in individually. 
So I'm actually going to do a second morph now. I'm going to give my character elf ears. So give me one second to look up elf ears for my character. All right, here we go. I have my elf ears. And uh, I'm going to just zoom in a little bit just on my character just so I can see the ears. And so here we go. I'm going to add my elf ears. Pretty simple. Going to max it out, obviously, as we talked about. Now, one thing I want to point out is I'm still on the second frame. I haven't gone to the third frame or the fourth frame. You don't go to the different frames based on how many uh, morphs you want to add. You add them all to the second frame. They're all done on the second frame. And the maximum value is on the second frame also, the maximum value for the slider. So uh, there we go. I've applied my two morphs that I want to be able to input into the Unreal Engine. And so we're just going to double check some things. So now that we've applied our morphs, morphs we're going to go back to our first uh, frame. And we're going to zoom out here. And you can see that's how our character would normally look. And then we're going to go back to our second frame, and we can see all of our morphs being applied. So the main thing, main takeaway here is you just want to make sure that your frame one, uh, you didn't apply a morph to your normal looking character on accident. So you want to make sure those two frames uh, are very are separated. So I recommend that you go ahead and save your file now, your DAS file. Go ahead and save that. Go ahead and save. There we go. Okay. Now you're going to want to go ahead and export this file as an FBX file. So to do that, we're going to go to File, Export, <clears throat> and then you're going to want to make sure to select SB FBX down here for Autodesk. And uh, for the file name, you can name it whatever. Uh, I already I've already done this tutorial a few times. This is my fifth or sixth attempt. So um, I already have some of these files, so it's just going to ask me to overwrite them. So we're going to go ahead and click Save. Yes, I know I have that file. That's okay. All right, these are the settings that you're going to want when you're exporting the FBX. So you're definitely going to want Morphs selected. Uh, you may not need the animation selected. This is something I've never tried, but uh, it's not going to hurt anything to have it selected. And I'm pretty sure you need it because we are exporting an animation on the timeline here. So I think that's good to have clicked. The uh, rest of the options are kind of um, up to you. Uh, this is what I use. If, if you're more advanced than me, you know that some of these can be uh, that are better than others, then feel free to do that. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and use these settings and just hit accept. Now, <clears throat> at some point, if you haven't set your total number of frames to 2, and said you had it like 30 or 60, while it's exporting the FBX, you're going to notice that, for one, your character is going to be flipping through different morphs and stuff on your screen. Perfectly normal. Don't freak out about that. Uh, for two, you'll notice that at some point, you'll go through each frame by frame and try and, like, basically set up each one of the settings. So... That's where it's going to cut down on some of the time if you only have two frames. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video while this exports the FBX, and then I will come back as soon as it is done. All right, there we go. Our uh, FBX got done saving, and so we are good to go. We actually don't even need uh, Dev Studio anymore, so you could close this out if you wanted. So the next thing we're going to open up is actually the Unreal Engine. Um, so let's go ahead and open up the Unreal Engine. So I'm going to go ahead and open up my launcher. I am going to go ahead and launch the uh, Unreal Engine here. So I'll save you having to wait through all this. So I'm going to go ahead and pause it. All right, so I'm going to go over to a new project. I'm going to select a blank project. Actually, I'm going to do this in C++. Just no real reason for the tutorial. I just like using C++ for my projects. Uh, all the standard stuff, desktop console, maximum quality with starter content. And I'm just going to name this toot, whoops, toot for morphs. All right, morph tutorial. Okay. I apologize. It just bugged me. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and create a project. And I'm going to go ahead and pause for all this loading. 
Now if you're following along, you may get your Visual Studio to open up because we selected a C++ target. If this pops up, just hit cancel and go ahead and just close uh, go ahead and just close the uh, Visual Studio project there and just wait for it to load. Oh, looks like it's done. All right, so now we are in the Unreal editor. Uh, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new folder and I'm going to name this characters. or just chars. And in here I'm going to make a new character which is the name of the character called Blair. And inside of this folder I'm going to make a new folder called Assets. Alright, and so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go find that FBX file that we exported from DAS and I'm just going to drop it right in here. Alright, so here is my Blair FBX file from DAS Studio. And I'm just going to go ahead and drag it in here. Now when I do this, it causes uh, this window, this window to lock up. So that's why I always make it smaller and kind of set it off to the side. It might happen for you, I'm not sure. And inside of here, what you're going to want to do is under the mesh section, you're going to want to do the show advanced little arrow down here. And you're going to want to make sure you have import morph targets selected. So go ahead and select that, and then you're going to just basically go ahead and hit import all, unless there's something else you needed to import or changes you needed to make for yourself. And this is obviously going to take several minutes, so I'm just going to go ahead and pause the video now until it's complete. All right, so our FBX finally imported, and uh, now we're getting some warnings on here. Now, honestly, I don't know why these warnings come up. And if someone could maybe explain this to me in the comments, uh, that'd be great, because I am still new to this. So I'm going to ahead and uh, just going to go ahead and say OK or clear this out. And uh, so here we have our character is imported. So now if you actually put your character on the map, you can see uh, your character come in. And... Uh, Let's go ahead and open up the skeleton for your character. And here is the skeleton for the character. Uh, if you opened up the, uh, what's it called here, the skeletal mesh, you can always just select the skeleton up at the top left here. Now what you're looking for is a window that says ANIM curves for animation curves. And if you don't have that window, you can go up to window here and uh, select it from the drop down there to make sure you're showing it. So here are all of the animation curves, or I should say the morphs for your character that can be dynamically edited. And when you first go into this, you're going to probably be a little disappointed because you're going to come up to your character and say, hey, let me modify the ears by using my elf ears. And that's normal for her to lose all of her textures is because it has to redo all the uh, shading when we move the uh, try and move the morphs. But you'll notice nothing happens to the ears when we move the morphs. And if we were to do any of the other morphs, they also would not do anything. This is uh, just a glitch, and I'll show you how to fix this. Also, before we move on, I also want to point out, do not rename these morphs. If you rename them, it will break the... Uh, the engine it will cause them to not function correctly and this is as of uh, 4.17.1 so it's broken at 4.17.1 and uh, you'll notice the textures are coming back slowly so what you need to do is you actually need to get out of here or just minimize it go over to your skeletal mesh for your character right click on it and say re-import and this should be fairly quick. You'll see eventually a little window will come up, say re-importing. It'll be pretty fast, just like a second or two. There it goes. Okay, maybe more than a second or two. And uh, now, when you go ahead and move the ear slider, well, hey, what do you know? It's, it's actually doing the morph. So now you've imported the morph into the game. But uh, So let, let's go ahead and let me show you something. So. If we go ahead and set the morph to 1, which is the maximum value you can set the morph to, 
she's got the pointy ears. We're going to go ahead and hit save. And now when we go into our game, you would expect, hey, she should have pointy ears. But lo and behold, she has rounded ears still. So the uh, the reason for this, whoops, I am messing up my windows. Let me go ahead and maximize this again. Uh, <clears throat> what we need to do is we need to create a blueprint for our character before we can have any of the modifications stick, essentially. Um, if we were to go back into our our skeleton and our skeletal mesh, right? Uh, if we close this out and go back into our skeleton, sorry for the weird window sizes here, you'll notice that the uh, morphs have all reset to zero anyways. So you can't really change the morphs permanently inside of here. Um, they have to be changed inside of the blueprint uh, dynamically, which is what we want anyways, and I'll show you how we do that. So let's go ahead and close this out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my content folder. I'm going to go into my character folder. I'm going to go into Blair. Now I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to call this Blueprints. All right. I'm going to go into my Blueprints folder, and I am going to create a new empty Blueprint class by selecting Blueprints. Now, you have an option, uh, and to be honest, I'm not as knowledgeable as a lot of these classes, uh, but I, as far as I understand, the character is kind of like the most advanced type of object as far as uh, like players go or, or character objects go. Then you have the pawn class, which is a little bit kind of watered down. And then you have the actor class, uh, which is watered down even farther. They're kind of like subclasses of the character class. So for this example, we're just going to go ahead and stick with pawn. Um, and we're going to go ahead and put this blueprint in the characters folder in Blair's folder under the blueprints. blueprints. And we're going to name this uh, Blair because that's the character's name. And we're going to underscore BP, just to signify that it's a blueprint. We're going to hit OK. And so now our blueprint opens. And uh, voila, but no Blair here. OK. So the first thing we have to do, and uh, one of the easier ways to do this, I'll show you both ways. One of the easier ways to do this is to go back into Blair's assets where the skeletal mesh and the skeleton are. And to select the skeletal mesh just in the content browser, not trying to open it necessarily, you just want it selected. Now when you go to your add component inside of your blueprint and you go down to skeletal mesh, you'll see that it has Blair TUT, which is our skeletal mesh that uh, is in our that's in our content browser that we have selected. So we're going to select that, and you'll notice it automatically names it, but more importantly, it automatically adds Blair's mesh to it. So if we were to delete this, and let's say we didn't have Blair selected in here, and we go in here and we go to Add Component, we'll go to Skeletal Mesh, notice that it does not have Blair's uh, name here. So if we go to Skeletal Mesh, it just leaves it as Skeletal Mesh, then you have to come over here and manually assign the Blair uh, Skeletal Mesh to the Skeletal Mesh component. So we're going to go ahead and delete this and just do it the other way, just because I prefer to do it that way. And there you go. Now we can see we have Blair inside of our blueprint. Now one of the things we want to do is get rid of this little ball here. It's kind of just a placeholder. So what we're going to do is, uh, it's considered the root node, so we're going to grab Blair and just drag it up to this default scene root, and it's just going to replace the root node, and that little ball is going to go away, as you noticed here. Okay, so now we have Blair uh, inside of our blueprint. So let's go ahead and compile this, just make sure no errors. Good, good, good. Okay, now we have to dynamically uh, tell the compiler at runtime, hey, we want you to add this morph to the skeletal mesh. 
So what you're going to do is you're now going to go to the event graph of your blueprint. And because of the tutorial and the way I'm going to do things, I'm going to get rid of event tick and actor begin overlap. That's all just going to go away. You might want to use them for, for what you're doing. Um, but for this tutorial, I'm going to get rid of it. And I'm just going to get rid of the comment bubble here. All right. So here is the trick. Here is the node that you need. You actually need the set target, uh, set morph target node here, and we're going to connect it to our event uh, on begin play. So we're just going to go into here and type in set morph target, and look, it even comes up with our skeletal mesh. All right, so it, it already knew that we wanted to apply it to our skeletal mesh. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of rearrange this a little bit here. So what we're doing is we're saying on the event, every time this event is triggered here, we're going to apply a morph to the skeletal mesh layer tutorial or tut. And uh, we need to give it a value and we need to give it a morph target name. So let's work on the morph target name. So unfortunately when you click on none or click on morph target name, um, there's no real Let's see, there's no real, wow, this is actually uh, new to me. I don't know that you can use this. So let me show you how I normally do it. So I actually have to just type, you have to type in the name. But there's an easier way than actually trying to remember those names. Since as we talked about already, you can't really rename them. So I'm going to go back to the character skeleton. And I've just, that's all I've done, I just opened up the character skeleton. And I'm going to select the ear, so I'm going to say rename, and I'm just going to copy this. And I'm not changing the name, I just wanted to be able to copy the name itself. Now I'm going to go back to my set morph target, and inside of the text, I'm just going to say paste. Simple, straightforward, easy to do. So now we're going to actually apply the elf ears morph to our... Uh, Skeletal mesh, thank you. And uh, what about the value? Okay, so the value, if we look at our slider here, uh, it has a maximum of one. One is the full amount of the morph that you're going to apply to it. So um, if you go to zero, zero is no morph, it's close to zero. And then negative one is kind of this weird, like the ears folding under. All right. So really zero to one is kind of what we're looking for. Now, technically, you can go beyond one and you can go lower than negative one. Uh, it will allow you to do that with this value. But for now, we're just going to put a value of one. OK, very simple, nothing complex. Um, let's go ahead and compile this and save it. And let's go ahead and run our game. And uh, escape. I apologize. I, I always forget about this little speaker up here. Where are you? I hate that it generates sound like that uh, right when you play. Okay, now let's go ahead and play our game. And you notice nothing's changed. The ears are still rounded. Well, what the heck? Well, it's because we haven't entered, we haven't actually dragged the blueprint over to the game. This here is actually the skeletal mesh dragged directly onto the map. And that's not what we want. So we're going to go ahead and delete this. And we are going to go back to content into our characters folder, into Blair, and we're going to go to blueprints. And now we're going to drag our actual blueprint. Um, let me just make it so she's touching the floor there, not in the floor. And uh, now this is our blueprint. So that we've actually changed, the, set the morph to update when the game starts. So let's see what happens here when we play. Uh, there you go. She's got elf ears. And you'll notice if we stop playing, the ears go back. That's because we've procedurally set the morph to be applied uh, inside of the blueprint itself. So sure, we could have done the ears ahead of time inside of Daz and just exported the character with elf ears. Uh, that's, so far, we haven't really seen a huge advantage to this. 
So let me show you where the real power behind this comes in. So let's go ahead and go back to our blueprint. And I've got my blueprint dragged off to the side. So currently we just set a value of 1 in there manually. What if we want to change this value dynamically? So what I'm going to do is I am going to use something called, whoops, I kind of cut out there, called a timeline. So I'm going to right click here and just type in timeline. Now uh, timelines are a little more advanced, so uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but uh, I'll kind of explain a little bit. So I'm going to name this um, auto scale, or slider, it's called slider. All right, and this thing is basically going to simulate moving the slider back and forth uh, as if we were doing it by hand. And instead of uh, the morph instantly taking effect, we're going to have the begin play go into our timeline and start the timeline up when the game starts. Now this update is essentially an event. Every time this auto slider generates a new value, it's going to generate an update event. And so we want this update event to go into our morph target because we're going to want to set a new value for a morph target every time a new value comes out of here. So let's double click on the auto slider or the timeline node. And what we're going to want to add is this add float track. What is this thing? Okay, uh, before we get into that, let me just put in a name for this track. We call it slider value. And I have to say I learned about this, uh, this node here through a tutorial, which I'm just going to throw out there really quick because I think it's a great tutorial. And it's all about C++ and anyone who's learning uh, Unreal should check it out. So I'm not affiliated with them in any way. This is the, uh, un the Unreal Engine Developer course for Udemy. And it is extremely long. I've been working on it for weeks and weeks, and I'm only 30% through. Uh, it's like 55 hours. Really in-depth, really great teaching. Uh, highly recommend it. And that's where I learned how to do this stuff from. Uh, well, I learned how to do the timeline for this from here. All right, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. All right. So we want to go ahead and we want to right click and say add key curve or key, just add a key basically. And what we're going to do is we're going to put in a value of zero and a value of zero for the time and the value. Essentially what we're doing with this is our timeline is going to have an output and the value coming out of that output is going to be based on these keyframes that we put into this graph. So let me go ahead and uh, give you start kind of adding these points, and uh, it might become more apparent when you actually see what's going on. Uh, so I want a value of one, and I want it at one second. Okay, let me put one more on here, and I'm gonna put it at time two. It's two seconds, and after two seconds, I want the value to be zero. Now I'm gonna add a little bit of fanciness. I'm gonna go to auto for interpolation, and just like auto again. All right, so what's actually happening here? Well, we're going to have a float value, a value coming out of this, um, this timeline, which I'll show you in a second. And when the timeline first starts, the value coming out is going to be zero, and it's going to start at zero. Now, as time goes on, as the time we go across the timeline here, the output of the value you can see is going to start going up. So the value is going to go all the way up to the value of 1. And then at 1 second, the output of this timeline is going to be 1. And then after another second, you see the value is going down, it's going down. Eventually it's going to go down to 0. Uh, and then we're in a second, we're going to set this up so that it will repeat. From here, I'll go up, come down, and then come here, go up, and go down. So basically the output of this uh, graph is just going to be uh, from 0 to 1 over 2 seconds. Okay, uh, You'll see it in action in a second, so if it doesn't make sense, just hold on and watch. Now we're going to go ahead and click Use Last Keyframe, just so the animation stops at the last keyframe instead of going all the way out to 5 seconds. Uh, if we were to wait for 5 seconds, the value would be 0, and then it would just sit here at 0 until we got to the 5 second mark, then it would repeat. 
So instead of doing that, we want it to just continually go between 0 and 1. We're going to put the use last keyframe. We're also going to put it on loop because we want this to continually loop over and over to go from 0 to 1. And uh, there we go. So we're going to go ahead and close this out. All right. There's a lot more to that, but and that's where I'm going to leave it for this tutorial. And here's slider value. So this is the value coming out of that graph, right? Remember we said it goes from 0 to 1 to 0. So over 2 seconds, the value coming out of here is going to go 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Every second, it's going to change. And that value is going to be put into our set morph target. So let's just see. Let's just run this and see what the effects are. So we're going to go ahead and compile this. And it uh, looks like everything is good. So let's go ahead and play here. And now let's go look at our ears. What are your ears are doing? Look at that. So it's going from 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And uh, it's actually morphing the character dynamically real time inside of the game. So you can use this. this. This seems to be a very powerful tool for custom character creation. and uh, Or if you need to make some kind of effect, like a morphing on your character or something, uh, I can see this being very useful. All right, so we're going to go ahead and hit Escape and stop this for now. OK. Oh, I did want to show you the blueprint as it runs. So here you go. You. Um, I, Whoops, I hit the wrong button. Let me go ahead and get my mouse back. Okay, so here you see the event began, and now it's updating, 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 and every time it updates, it sends a new value. Uh, there you go, you can see it going from 0 to, to uh, 0 0.9999 to 0 to 0.999. So hopefully you get the idea of what's going on here. All right, let's go ahead and stop this. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add our other morphs to this. So let's go ahead and copy this. Now, one of the issues that I came across while doing this is that uh, the clothing does have its own morph. So if you morph the body of the character, then the clothing does not seem to follow the body uh, unless you animate it. So uh, I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. Well, I'll explain what I mean because I can't really show you due to uh, some technical difficulties. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Nope. Uh, I wanted to connect this to here. And so basically I'm just making copies of this. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to change the name of the morph target. That's all I'm going to do. And I'm going to daisy chain the events here so that all four of these are executed every time there's an update. And then I'm going to just take the same value from the slider and I'm going to put it into every one of these values. Now you could probably use a variable, uh, but I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes. Okay, so we have the ears. All of these are ears for the morph target. So let's go back here and let's change the female. Let's uh, get the oops, all right. Let's go ahead and copy this, the name of the morph target, and let's go ahead and put the name of the morph inside of here. And uh, we're going to do that for the other ones. Now, what we're doing is uh, one of these morphs is actually for the body, the other two are for the top and the skirt. And uh, if we don't animate these together, then what happens is the body ends up uh, coming out of the skirt and the top. So you've got to morph them at the same time so that we don't have any uh, technical difficulties. So here we've got the skirt set in there, the top set in there, and the female, Genesis 3 female set in there. And we're still doing the elf ears. Okay, so nothing's, nothing's really different. We're just copying this kind of example. <laughs> and then we're going to compile this. Now let's go back to our game. And uh, let's go ahead and start our game. And now you'll see, now we have the characters actually weight and clothing 
is actually stretching and uh, dynamically changing with the value that we set to it. So we can actually change this in the blueprint. It's not something that uh, we have to, you know, it's, it's actually dynamically modified inside of the blueprint. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and hit Escape to stop this. Now, uh, the next problem you're going to run into, and uh, so, so I showed you how to dynamically import more. I showed you how to import more for Jazz Studio, how to dynamically modify them inside the blueprint. Uh, the next problem I'm going to show you is how to add animations to this so that uh, you can just kind of see how the animations affect game morphing. And I'm going to use iClones to do that. Now let me preface this by saying that uh, if you don't care about, if you already know how to import animations, you can pretty much stop the video right now. Um, however, if you're kind of new to this and you're, you're not sure how to import the animations without actually having to import the whole character over again, uh, let me go ahead and show you that. I will say this, though, however, before you leave, that the uh, one problem I ran into is when I tried to export the FBX from Dash Studio into iClones, the morphs actually ended up disappearing. And so you can't import it into iClones and then import, export uh, the iClone FBX from iClones into this. Uh, you end up losing all the morphs uh, and just have the animations. So with, I'm going to show you the method to be able to add the animations, the animations while keeping all the morphs there. Um, and it's actually really easy to keep adding new um, animations to the character without having to redo everything. So let me go ahead and show you that now. All right, for those of you uh, maybe even uh, thinking about doing iClones or want to see how it's done on iClones, uh, I just want to do a, take a, a quick few seconds to point something out to some people that might not know anything about iClones or how it works. All right, here's the iClone website. So if you go to buy, all right, um, they have, it uh, looks like iClone 7, $200. Whee! Like, I'd be so excited to be like, dude, hands down, buy it, okay? Here's the problem. Here's what you probably don't realize if you're new to iClone. iClones itself is completely inclusive. You can't import files, can't export files, nothing. Um, I mean, you can import maybe like sounds and stuff. But you can't import any kind of modeling data. So you have to actually use a separate program called 3D Exchange. There are actually two separate programs. Now, uh, you might look at this and say, oh, 3D Exchange Pro, $299. Hey, that's awesome. I'll, all right, $100 more. I can see that. I'll go for the $299. Well, let me explain something to you that's not explicitly stated and it's kind of buried. You kind of got to read. Uh, 3D Exchange will only let you import characters. It won't let you export the characters. So you can import characters from like Daz Studio or, uh, you know, Maya or wherever you're getting the character from. You can import it in iClone 7, but you still can't export it. So you can animate it and everything, but you can't export it anywhere. Which is a huge bummer because I was really I, I was really excited about this. Then you get down to the uh, what's called the animation pipeline, and so 3D Exchange Seven anime, uh, pipeline is whoops I kind of don't want to do that. Okay, so they show you here with 3D Exchange Seven you can uh, basically go into iClones. Uh, and then you can bring it into like the game engine. So if you really, if you want to use iClones, you really have to pay six hundred dollars to get iClone Seven uh, to get the three D Exchange Seven pipeline to be able to import it um, for the uh, iClones. Sorry, I got a little distracted. You have to get the three D Exchange Seven pipeline to include uh, export into the Unreal Engine. All right, that being said, there's all kinds of like uh, add-ons you have to get to get to work with Daz, um, I think, I don't know, it might come with it. I can't remember if it came with it or not uh, to import Daz Studio stuff. 
So anyways, I just wanted to point that out. That if you're having problems, you can't figure out, like, you downloaded iClones, you're like, what the hell, I can't get any of my characters in or out of it. It's all because you have to have this external program. And it has to be the pipeline to get it into Unreal Engine. That all being said, I love uh, iClone. Um, it's worth the money for me because it's very simple to animate things. And... Um, I am new to animation, and there's a lot of tools, and they make it very, very user friendly. It's very, very, pretty much straightforward. Uh, however, it's not nearly as advanced as advanced as some of the other tools like Maya or 3ds Max or anything like that. So, I mean, you're not going to be doing these crazy, awesome animation things, but it's very simple to use. Uh, it's great for a starting tool, but at $600, I don't know you have to decide. All right, I'll stop talking about that. Let's actually get into the uh, 3D Exchange Pipeline. So let me go ahead and open that up. Alright, so here is what 3D Exchange Pipeline looks like. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and go to Open. And we are going to select the FBX file from the Dash Studio that we imported from Dash Studio. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this. Now it's very important that you do not import the animations. What ends up happening is uh, inside of iClones your animations get all screwy. All of a sudden your morphs start playing for at random periods on your timeline for like no reason with no keyframes or anything. Like, I don't know why it happens. Just whatever you do, you don't want to import animations from uh, Dev Studio. Also I don't click the adjust color, uh, material color automatically makes your character look like plastic basically. Alright, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause this while this loads. Alright, eventually it's gonna come up and say, hey, I basically detected that your character is Genesis 3 from Daz. Do you want to convert it to a non-standard talking character? Uh, just go ahead and say yes. Now when you first import this, you're gonna look at this and you go, uh, that looks like crap. But do not worry, uh, it actually looks a lot better in the Unreal Engine. For, and for two, if you were to use this model it, uh, from iPhones, uh, it does actually look a lot better inside of the Unreal Engine than it's displayed inside of uh, iClones. Remember, iClones is more of an animating tool, I, I feel. But uh, we're also not going to be using any of the textures or anything from this. We're just using the animations. So you don't have to worry about getting all the materials set up, none of that. Okay, we just are importing the skeleton, basically, and the mesh, so that we get a good idea of how our character is going to be animated. So one thing I want to point out is that when you import the FBX inside of the face setup and the expression editor, you will see the... Uh, you will see the morphs inside of here. You may get excited and go, hey, I could probably just use the FBXs from uh, iClones. It shows them right there. Uh, however, from so far with my experience, these don't import correctly into the Unreal Engine, and it, uh, it just, you lose all your morphs. So I, I know that they show it here, but it doesn't work right. So what you're going to do, first thing I recommend is, uh, or first thing you're going to do actually, is just export this as a iClone file. And so you're going to give it a name. Uh, I think Blair Tutorial is what we named uh, our, our character when we exported it from Daz Studio. Um, none of this really matters. Uh, you should not have any animation settings here. This should be blanked out because you're not importing any animations from DAS. If you do have this option available, you need to go back and look at your settings as you imported the FBX. And then obviously you're going to want to select where you save a file. So what you're actually doing is, is uh, uh, 3D Exchange is actually saving it as what's called an iAvatar file. So it's like the only file that, um, that iClones will import. And so the 3D Exchange is the only program that can generate that type of file. So that's how they work. It is kind of a scam. That's, uh, again, I love the iClone software. It's just I feel like it's kind of... Uh, I, I don't like how they do this at all. Okay. So go ahead and hit OK. And it's going to... I already have that file in place. So it's going to still have to replace it. I'm just going to say yes. And yours isn't going to say that. And uh, what it creates is actually an iAvatar file. So 
Next thing to do is we need to go ahead and open up iClones itself. So let's go ahead and do that. And I keep calling it iClones. And yes, I know it's iClone. I just have a habit of saying clones for some reason. All right, here we go. Here's iClone uh, finally opened up here. And we are going, now you don't want to go to file open because it's going to try to open a project file. What you need to do is go file import. Um, and you're going to go to, this is the iAvatar file that the 3D Exchange uh, file uh, program created. So you're just going to go ahead and open this. And this is going to bring in your glare model with the skeleton and everything attached to it. So we go to pause. And of course, right after I pause, it imports. <clears throat> so here's your character. All right. Now for tutorial purposes, I'm just going to go ahead and throw an animation on here. But uh, before you do anything, okay, let me let me take, take a step back. Before you do anything, you should have a little play button here on the bottom of this window. Go ahead and play this. Now, if you import this incorrectly and you import the animation from Das Studio, you'll notice every once in a while, randomly, you'll just see the morphs. It'll just morph and then go back, morph and then go back. And uh, there's no way to fix it that I know of. Um, so that's why we didn't import any of the animations from Dance Studio. And as you can see, we don't see any movement. So that's a good sign. She should be completely rock still. When you... And uh, whoops, I clicked the wrong button again. All right. So she should be completely rock steady when you first import her. All right. <laughs> Next thing you're going to need to do is if you don't have this timeline open already, you're going to need to go to Window, Timeline, or press F3. Open this timeline. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just close everything on the timeline, and I want to show you what you're going to need uh, to be able to get this project going. So I want to point out one thing. For one, 3D Exchange names your character root node for whatever reason. Maybe there's a way to change this, but uh, for now it's just called root node. That's how it imports in Dev Studio or icons. So you're going to want to click on this little track menu, and you're going to notice this is avatar and root node. That's actually your character. So go ahead and click on that. Now I'm immediately going to just delete all these tracks out of there. So uh, here's root node, and you notice it has no channels or anything on it. So in order to add a channel, you're going to click this little like drop down arrow next to the X. And you're going to see it comes up the list of all the different tracks that you can select. Now the four are probably more used. Uh, tracks and, and again I could be wrong about this but you're gonna want definitely the collect clip that's what we're here for and if you're doing your own animation you're probably gonna want transform motion and uh, motion layer at least I'm sure a lot of this other stuff will be used uh, collect clip basically is like your your select all kind of I guess or your selection uh, ability we'll get into that in a second transforms pretty obvious Motion is uh, any motion you generate using any of the tools in iClone. And motion layer is essentially all the motions for the different body parts. Okay, so that's how you can get all of these layers open as if nothing was here at all. Okay, so that being said, there's all kinds of tutorials and tools on how to do your animations. And, um, that's not what this tutorial is about. It's not about how to do your animations in iClones. It's just about uh, getting animations to your character. So for the sake of time, I'm just going to go in here and go to my motion puppet. And I'm just going to select move. And I'm just going to select a basic block. I'm going to record this. Yeah, whoops. I should start my character. It should start at the beginning. Let me move this all the way over. All right. Start at the beginning. I'm going to go ahead and hit record. And she's going to start walking. And this is going to record to my motion layer. And that's good enough. All right. So now if I go back through my timeline, I can see you know, she stops moving to the point where I stopped. But up until then, it's completely animated. OK, we got that. So what we're going to do now is, and, and again, I'm not going to worry about looping this animation or anything. I'm just going to grab a section of it. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm left clicking on the collect clip track and I'm just selecting kind of a portion of this animation that I want to save. 
And so you can select anywhere, any portion of the animation that you want to save. You don't have to start at the beginning, so you don't have to worry about getting your character all lined up at the beginning or anything. And then you're just going to right click on this, see add motion to library, and I've got a folder already set up for it. And again, I've already got this file because I've done this tutorial a few times. And so I'm just going to save this as Blair uh, Walk. Okay, save that. And yes. Now what I want to point out is what you're saving is an actual iClones type of file. It doesn't go into any other program that I know of. And so it's actually reusable. So if you come in here and you have another character that you want to apply this motion to, uh, maybe a male character or another uh, Genesis 3 character. There are ways of loading that file back up. You have to do a little research on it, so I'm not going to go into it here, but uh, you can reuse that animation, okay? Now, for this, I'm going to go ahead and create uh, two uh, animations. And uh, let me go ahead and delete this. All right. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do an idle move. And let's do uh, hands on hips. And I'm just going to, I'm at my first keyframe again. And I'm just going to hit the space bar. All right. There's a pretty big sway there. Let's see if we get another pretty big sway. Boom. There we go. Okay. So it's repeated. I'm going to go ahead and stop that. Now, normally I would dink with this and try and get the loop to be perfect, but for now I'm just going to go ahead and grab a section of it. And I'm going to right click, add to motion library, and again I have Blair Idle. So I'm going to go ahead and hit save here and save the animation. So now I've got two saved animations for this character. Now I want to point out that this timeline is not going to go with our character. So whatever's in this timeline is not actually the animation that's going to be exported. What's going to be port exported is the actual selection that you made and said add motion to library. That's the only part of the motion that's actually going to be exported into the Unreal Engine. So those files are actually the most important part of this process. Now, normally you'd go to 3D uh, Edit and 3D Exchange, and you could still do that. Uh, but this time, we already have the FBX file loaded in the uh, pipeline. So they're in the uh, 3D Exchange pipeline. There's no real reason to send it back from the uh, from the project in iClones to the pipeline there. Right? None of that I can see at least. Maybe there is something that I'm missing, but. All we really need to do is go to import here under animation. Then we're just going to import those two animations that we selected. And uh, we're just going to open them in here. Now if you try and export the FBX right now, you'll get no animation. No animation. Because all you've done is actually imported the files for use. But you haven't actually added them to the character. So what you have to do is you have to click add to perform. And in fact, if you just go add all to perform, it'll make duplicates here. So let me just delete this one. So you could just do add all. I don't want to add all of them here. Okay, so here's our two animations. Now at this point, because we added them to perform, the perform editor, yes, it will um, add them to the FBX file now at this point. Okay, here's something that's key. When we go to export this, um, file name, we'll just leave it as Blair Tutorial here. <laughs> now we may not need this geometry. I, ha I haven't tested this, but I'm going to do it the way I normally do it. Maybe at the end I'll go back and check something. Uh, but the first thing, you're, go ahead and just leave this as include geometry for now, but you may not need it. And I usually go in here, it's like Game Engine Unreal, and then I reset this to 4000 by 96. Um, Probably too much, too heavy on the game engine, probably not required. I do it anyways, not a big deal. All right, uh, we definitely want to include the animation uh, because that's what we're here for. However, here's a little uh, uh, kind of a uh, uh, saved, a little trick here. You definitely want to tick save one per file. Uh, this allows you to kind of organize your FBXs that we're going to create here. 
And uh, essentially what's going to happen is for every animation you have, it's going to create its own individual FBX. And this save process is not very long. I mean, if you have a bunch of animations, it might take maybe like five or six minutes, but we only have two animations and they're short like this. It takes a few seconds. Uh, and I'll show you uh, why that's important. It allows you to organize things and, and makes clear what animations are where. Um, embed textures, this is not really going to matter. Um, and then you're just going to want to select the folder you're going to want to save them to. Hit OK. And export those files. So I'm going to go ahead and pause it. All right, so we exported those FBXs. So what we're going to do is we're now going to go back to the Unreal Engine. So let me go to my engine here. And to keep everything consistent, I'm going to go into Characters, Blair. And I'm going to make a folder, a new folder called Animations. Okay. All right, and this is where I'm going to import the animations from icons. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to open up the location. Uh, I'm going to open up the iClone animation, or the, I'm sorry, the iClone animations is the iMotion files for iClone only. And this is the avatar that we created with the uh, 3D exchange only. The FBX animations are the ones that we just exported from the from here, from the iClone Exchange with these two files. Okay, so they actually export as FBX files. Now, if you'll notice, we have two of them, and we've probably already gathered. It's pretty pretty straightforward. But the reason why we have two of them is because of that option I told you to select. So see, you can easily see, oh, this is the idle animation, this is the walk animation. And uh, I believe if you don't separate the files like this, you have to manually separate. If you only have one FBX, you have to go in manually and like split up the animations and all that. It just, uh, I haven't done that yet, but I, I, from my understanding, that's what you have to do if you use one FBX. So it just kind of simplifies things if you have that option tech where you can easily have all the animations separate. Yeah, the files are bigger, but eh, really they're not that big. All right, so we select the animation, and uh, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to move this a little more out of the way because it locks up. I'm going to select both files, and I'm going to wait till I get the OK here and drop the files. Now, when you import these, you absolutely want to make sure you do not import the mesh. So see, there was an option here. Uh, if we go to FBX export, there was an option to not include the geometry or the mesh. So I'm wondering if we could use that uh, instead and we just wouldn't have to set it up here. That I don't know. But when we import it in here, we definitely want to make sure import mesh is not checked. We want to leave skeletal mesh. This needs to be checked. But import mesh not check. If you're not sure, if you click the wrong thing, notice that when I select uh, uncheck import mesh, that I still have the option to select a skeleton. Okay. When I uncheck skeletal mesh, that option for the skeleton goes away completely. Okay. So that's how you can check to make sure. So uncheck import mesh. And for the skeleton, this is the skeleton from the original FBX from Daz that we've imported already. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and select that skeleton. And it's got the different, I leave everything default, but it's got the different settings you can set, whatever. Uh, just real quick, you might be wondering what the difference is between import all and import. So right now we're drag, we drag and drop two separate files into this. If we hit import all, it will apply these settings to both of the files that we import. If we just hit import, it'll only do it to the first file, and then we'll get this we'll get this window again when it tries to do the second file. So let's just do import all, and you'll see it, it's actually fairly quick to import the animations. So um, it doesn't take much to update the animations, and boom, there you go. Now you've got your two animations, all right? So, um, in fact, let me just see. I'm just curious because I haven't tried this. If we just drag the animation directly onto the game, uh, to the game, and if we play this, yeah, see, I, I think we'll see the animation just like it, it normally is, okay? But that's not what we're here to do. 
So uh, there's all kinds of ways to manipulate the animations through player controllers and all this stuff. That's a whole other section that we're not even going to touch. All I want to show you is that if we go into our blue, excuse me, if we go into our blueprint for Blair, open this back up, and of course I got it off screen there. <coughs> I just want to show you how these morph targets affect your animations. So if you go into, if you look for a node called Sequencer, or Sequence, uh, essentially it just allows you to make multiple events from one event. So I'm just going to go ahead and put the begin play event into the sequence, and then the sequence is going to generate multiple events. So we're still going to animate our, uh, our our morphs there, but now we're also going to add the node uh, play animation. And uh, believe me when I tell you, I, I understand. There's a whole bunch of other stuff you can do with this. This is just real quick demonstration. All right, we're going to tag the uh, event to the play animation, and then in the new animation to play, we're going to go ahead and select. Uh, Blair tutorial walk okay and we're gonna want it to loop so we're gonna select that okay so in case I was too far away the first time I was doing this stuff there's kind of a quick scroll of it kind of closer up all right uh, we're gonna go ahead and compile this and I said okay I can do that so we're all good to go let's go ahead and play this and see what happens and so we're getting a little bit of clipping on the lower side due to our animation, but uh, you know that can be worked out. And uh, there you go. You can see that you can actually morph stuff while your animation is going. So you can. Uh, it doesn't affect your animations other than you know if she gets too fat, her hands will be in her ass. <laughs> and there may be ways to fix that, but um, yeah. So that is it for this tutorial. Uh, I hope this is helpful, and I know it's an hour long, but uh, as you can see, there's quite a bit uh, trying to cover. So I uh, hope this is helpful. If you guys, uh, and again, I am completely new to this, so if you guys have any tips or suggestions or think I'm doing something wrong or um, want to throw something out there, please feel free to do so in the comments there. Uh, I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can. So thank you.